And I don't know if you heard that or not, but we are recording the meeting. I want you to know. So just, just so you're aware, um, we're not going to publish any of your comments or anything like that. So we'll be edited. Um, Oscar BC, uh, if you don't know already, it's a not-for-profit uh, organization, a society incorporated in BC. And uh, three of our board members are presenting today. Uh, John Yap is, is the chair president of Oscar BC. We have John Robertson, who's been with, with the society from the beginning. And Patricia Scott from uh, Chilliwack, who's uh, new to our board, but uh, uh, a very great volunteer. And thank you all three of you, as well as Jenica. Jenica, as mentioned, is with the Chilliwack Division of Family Practice. Both Jenica and Patty are, are experts in billing, and uh, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of insights uh, uh, from their end, uh, end of the process. Uh, the webinar leads, they've created a great uh, PowerPoint resource, and that, that will be or has been already posted on the Oscar BC website, so you can check that out for sure. It's on our resources page. If you have questions uh, regarding within the webinar, please direct them uh, through chat to Cindy Babin. Uh, she'll be uh, keeping track of those questions and giving them to the presenters uh, for ask for replying to at the appropriate time. As I mentioned, we're going to post uh, video segments from the webinar on the Oscar BC website uh, or Oscar BC YouTube channel. So check that out. We have a whole uh, raft of videos on there for different uh, different resources. Um, the next webinar uh, is going to be, we believe, on prescribing, and we haven't set a date for that yet or how exactly any of the details on it, but just keep that in mind that that'll be the next one. So without any further babbling on for myself, uh, by the way, I'm Ken Beacott. I'm the executive director with Oscar BC. Uh, formerly executive director with the Chilliwack Division. So it's nice to have Jenica join us today and Patty as well, who's also uh, working with them. Okay, take it away, Jenica and Patty. Hi there, everyone. Welcome. So nice to see big numbers, especially for early Saturday morning. Um, Jenica is going to do a majority of the speaking to the slides. And uh, I will then be showing you in the uh, EMR, we have a version of Oscar. It's a well version of Oscar. So if it looks different than yours, that would be the reason. Um, and anything you'd like to say, Jenica, before we dive in? No, I'll just say hi. I'm, my name is Jenica. I have been a MOA since 2004 and have been doing MSP billing uh, since that time. So uh, I hope I can assist anyone who's got questions uh, at the end of this. Fabulous. Okay, then we can just dive right in. All right. So basically me and Patty met together and there was some feedback and questions that were provided to uh, Oscar BC uh, for MOAs who had questions around different variations of the MSP billing. Um, what we've done is kind of taken a consensus of what the mostly asked questions were and kind of went from there. Um, a lot of questions around diagnostic codes and what's best to be billing with what. Um, a lot of people uh, ask questions about lacerations and how to be billing um, those. Uh, once you should know that there is no code for laceration. Uh, obviously it is just the open wound series which starts at 870 and what you can do is um, actually just type in open wound and it'll search it and you can look up the body part. Um, you can also link diagnostic codes to service slash procedure codes and we're going to demonstrate this for you. Um, I've also provided an ICD-9 code sheet for you um, and those resources can be found on the Oscar BC resources page for after. Oops. Well, best laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So let's just show you uh, what Jenica was just explaining. A couple of different ways. I noticed when I went into a practice to help an MOA the other day that she only, she thought she could only enter the billing 
through the scheduler. But in actual fact, uh, if the patient wasn't seen in the office, you can search them here. And so you can then just go directly to their master file from here. We'll choose Mickey for this. And then you can choose your invoicing from here. So you can create your invoice here. So that might save some time. Some of the key things we'll point out with the diagnostic code, but I just wanna make sure you're always checking to be sure that you have the right billing position and that you have who you're billing to in place. Location usually stays pretty standard unless you'd like to change it for hospital and so on. And uh, we'll talk later about some of the other details, but the diagnostic codes that she was speaking of can be linked and the service codes can go here. So you were saying um, open wound, right? That's diagnostic code though. This one is actually service. Yeah. Oh, diagnostic was open wound. Yeah. The 13611 okay. is good to use. Okay, there you go. And you can put, there it is on the um, billing form already, right? So if I were to type this in, tell us what happens, Jenica. The difference between so there is a difference um for people who are able to link their their uh tray fees to their ser um service code uh that really only works if you have the service on your billing form so like patty said it's showing there if you were to just type the 13611 it's not going to auto populate that tray fee you actually need it embedded in your billing form uh, for the auto population to occur. So you can see in this one here, she has, um, you know, the 13611, she's clicked that with a 90, but she's also adjusted a diagnostic code to go with that, which auto populated with it, which is an 879, which I believe is just open wound unspecified. Um, so if you have a doctor who does a lot of uh, mole removals or, you know, basic, uh, in office procedures and they're typically the same, you can put your diagnostic code to it. And then if for some other reason you are doing a procedure and it's a different one, you can always just erase it. But that helps if you're generally doing the same procedures in office over and over again. Okay. So are you back seeing the um, slides? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So the next slide we were gonna talk about is billing forms. You're gonna get another more in-depth look at this later, but just for our MOA focus, how would you like to start with that, Jenica? Yeah, so there are, you can create different types of billing forms, which is when you go to bill something, that's the screen that pops up that you're going to see. You can create them if you have different uh, specialties in the office. Um, so there can be a different one for GPs, a different one for RNs, a different one for nurse practitioners. Um, some of you know there may be different forms for private fees or third party, and Patty's going to show you what we mean by that. Yes, right now with PCNs, patient care networks in different divisions, we have um, at contract physicians, contract NPs, and RNIPs. And it's nice to be able to create different billing forms for them because they use different codes. So a regular family practitioner would fee for service would use these codes, but a nurse in practice it, through the PCN would be billing with a 3800 series of codes. So to make life much better for that RNIP, you'd be able to create, and here's where you would change your billing form, you would create one that says RNIP, okay? And it gives a different set of codes. And as Jenica mentioned, it's very handy to have one for your private fee schedule for your practice. So these are all of the codes for your front desk to be charging private fees, much handier than having to search them every time, okay? But the key here is to always ensure that you have the right billing physician, okay? And the other key is when you're setting up the RNIP or the uh, contract physicians uh, and NPs, they have to, of course, be set up as a billing practitioner. I know that that sounds, you know, of course, but with the RNIP role, it, it has been a bit of a question. They definitely need to be set up as a practitioner so that they can do their encounter coding. It's a zero dollar coding, but if they have their own schedule, 
it makes everything so much easier if they have their own billing form. Now, how do you get these billing forms? Okay, so we can go back to the main appointment screen. Now I'm, I'm using a well version. So sometimes it's different if you're using different versions of OSPIR like Open OSP it could be slightly different. It could also be different if you're using Juno. But if you go to the administration and you go to billing, you'll be able to see billing forms, manage billing forms. This is where you would add your private fee codes. These are all the different billing tabs, but manage billing forms is where you wanna go. And you'll notice in this practice version, we have the GP, we have midwife, we have obstetrics, we have private. I've even created one called Patty. <laughs> so you can open one or you can create a new one. So it's add, edit, delete, right? You click Patty, service. Sorry. Yes, uh, absolutely. Can you, can you make your font larger? You bet. So you yeah, let's see what we can do here. Uh, there we go. Is that there a little go. better? Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's better. better. You slide Thank you. It. Absolutely. Slide it a little over. So glad you did that. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So back up to the top. So you select from the drop down, add, edit, delete, and you make sure you check off service. Okay. And then you hit manage. Now, unfortunately, this trial version, that's as far as we can, we can call them different names, like the different columns. Uh, and then you can give it a name for your set. Like, um, I think we called this one Patty. You could call this um, RNIP if you wished. And then you would have, it, it allowed me to do it, Jan. Okay, it wasn't allowing me to do it yesterday. So I thought I was gonna have to stop there, but <laughs> now you have that RNIP that I mentioned, right? So you have to select it again from the list, select service codes, and now manage it, perfect. And now you add all the codes that you need down here and you'll add unit numbers. This is um, just gonna keep them in order of being seen. You can title each row as well, if you find that useful. I like to group them for the RNIPs, putting them together, the procedures, putting together the ones that need start and end times, just to make things a little easier but every person will set them up to their, um, whatever is good for them. Okay. Patty, if I may yeah. just chime in. You bet, please One do. One step back is a critical move. And that is the ID for each form has to have a unique um, name, a designation. Okay. You can give it yeah. a title of uh, anything uh, you know, helpful you want. Um, and this is covered later in my slides. Um, yes. The key yeah. is without a unique ID name, um it won't work and right you won't be able to edit yeah so okay. on the right hand side we see vac for vaccine and mw for midwifery there needs yeah. to be an id code to match with your form okay so would that be rnip would that be good for it that could be anything you wish yeah as long okay. as it's unique <laughs> okay so then you added the form and then once we are um going to edit the form, we can manage it. That's where we are. Like I said, you can change the names of the different groups, but at the very end, you update. Now I like to show, if I'm setting this up as an MOA or as a practice manager, I do like to show the um, ability to change it to the position I'm working with if they haven't had that opportunity or to the RNIP or whoever I'm making the form for so that they can then maintain it for themselves if they, would like to move things around a little bit or change it, okay? And then you hit update and then you should be good to go. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, we're gonna do that at the end, my apologies. I'm an instructor, so I'm used to asking <laughs> at each interval. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Where are we at with that? So there are a large number of slides, in, 95 slides in this deck. And we can thank Dr. John Yap for putting together some fantastic step-by-step -step and screenshot ones later. And there is some around the billing form. So if you didn't make good notes, you can always use those step-by-step -step slides later. Okay, and we'll just move on to our next one. And as we briefly mentioned, linking. Go ahead, Danica. 
Uh, yeah, so we had briefly mentioned before linking uh, service fee and procedure codes are linking tray fees to different um, service codes so they're not forgotten. Also, so you're always billing the correct tray fee to go with the correct service. Um, as in the slide previous with the laceration and tray fee we showed, um, and we're going to show you how this is done and the doctors have a wonderful step by step screenshot that they will be showing later on how to do that. Yeah, if they don't get to it, it is in the slide deck for you to view later. Okay, so let's go back and talk about that. Now, the beauty of it is you need to go with the way your practice runs normally. So some offices always do a urinalysis with a complete physical, some don't. So if that's something that happens routinely in your office, then you can link that with your uh, fee code for complete physical. Okay, so the way we do that is we go to administration, again, billing, and manage billing codes. Okay, and then you can add billing codes I, and then I manage think it's diagnosis. manage procedure fee code. There you go, right here. And down, see, we've added a few together. There was the 13611, the laceration. We added it with a tray fee and 90. Okay, so then you don't have to look it up and if you don't use it very often, if it's set up like that, it'll automatically add. But again, as Jenica mentioned, it is important that you do it, like that the physician, if they're doing their own billing or if you're doing the billing, that you click it on the form, billing form, that you don't just add 13611. Because if you just put 13611 in the service code area, it won't automatically come up with the 90. The same with the 14091. If you routinely, and not every practice does, but if you routinely do your analysis with that prenatal follow-up, then link them together and it won't be forgotten. Okay? So if we look at the billing screen and we create an invoice, We'll show you that one more time. So I showed you with the 13611, but the 14091, let's see where we've got that. Right here, the follow-up prenatal. If you were to type it in here, you would need to, it'll work, but you won't, you would have to add the 15130 here. However, if you were instead able to click it, you had it set up on your form, billing form, and there it is. The two will appear together for you. And if at one point you didn't do the urinalysis, you can simply delete that one and it's totally fine. So if sometimes you don't do it, you can just delete it, it'll, it'll be okay. But the key here is to remember that you have to have the correct billing form. So make sure you have your right billing physician, your provider, and the right billing form. Okay, and then here's where your diagnostic codes would go. Okay, and we will go back to our PowerPoints. Okay, there were lots of questions about remittances and um, Jenica does a lot of billing for a lot of different practitioners on a daily basis. So this is her area of expertise. Take it away, Jenica. <laughs> so yeah, there was a lot of questions around remittance. Um, obviously the most um, confusing part of the remittances is the number of rejection codes that can be given back to you. I have provided Oscar with a really nice cheat sheet to, to um, kind of further explain some of those codes and once again you can find those on the Oscar BC website under resources. Um, so a few tips and tricks uh, that I like to share with people is printing a full uh, reconciliation report. So a lot of people will pull their remittance, pull off the summary, and then go to the rejection and pay, uh, paid with exceptions in their billing screen under the edit tab. Um, I find it actually more beneficial to read the MSP reconciliation report, the full report. And the reason for that is they sometimes give you actually different information in that remittance than you receive through the auto-populated rejections in, in Oscar. Um, so a lot of the time, 
you're going to be getting your debit request from MSP through that remittance. So if you're not printing it, you're actually probably not even noticing it. Um, also, number two is that in the in the remittance, they actually give you the WCB claim number on patients. So you'll notice that in your paid with exceptions folder, you'll get a lot of your WCBs coming back. And they're going to say, please update with WCB claim number. That claim number is actually on your remittance. So it doesn't auto populate into the patient's chart after that. You have to either physically go into the remittance, look for that number, or you can wait for WCB to send you that notification paper. Um, the biggest thing is debit requests that I feel go unnoticed quite a bit. So there's two reasons you're going to do a debit request. One of them is, say, you accidentally build the wrong code for a patient and sent it off. You're going to have to wait for that payment to come back, but you want to reverse it and bill it under the appropriate fee code. So in a case where you're debiting your own billing, what you're going to do is you're going to go to that bill, you're going to open the invoice, and you're going to change the subcode to E for debit. Um, you can do this by going through the master file and going into the invoice list and opening up the claim. Uh, but what you want to do is and this is how I do it. I'm not sure if anyone has a different format. Um, I'll just get Patty to pull that up there. Yeah, so we're in the master file. And you yeah, go so to go to invoice list. list. Yeah. This and there's no bill there, but lot. you would go to edit. You would change your submission code to E. And actually what I do is I do an internal adjustment and I actually put the amount for the bill and I click internal adjustment and then I reprocess it and send it back to MSP. And what's going to happen is when MSP acknowledges that they are debiting it, it's going to have a negative sign when you send it. But when it comes back, it's going to go back to zero. So there'll be no money owing on that. And at that point, that's when you can rebuild the service that you were intending to build. A second reason you will get a debit request is because MSP is requesting it. And this, once again, is something you're only going to see in your remittance. And that works just the same. Sometimes MSP says, we've paid you for this, but this is how this, or there's other reasons they want some money back. And same instance, you're going to go to your invoice list. You're going to pick the one that they would like a debit of, and you're going to do the e-submission code. But once again, those things are only found on a full remittance report. Um, so that's the place where you're going to find a lot of these these kind of requests that MSP is making. So just I just recommend printing one off, taking a look at it, and you'll see the DR for anything that MSP is asking you to, to debit and send back to them. Okay, so Jenica, we're in there, and I'm going to this submission code area. Yes, ma'am. And that's where we're going to change it to, to debit, debit request. request. Yep. There we go. And it made some changes, right? Yeah. And then and I actually, if you just scroll up for a bit there, Patty. Yes, yeah. obviously you need to uh, <laughs> do all that. But uh, I do the internal adjustment on that right-hand side there. So I'll put the 6487 in there, and then I'll tick off that little box. Okay. Yeah. And then we go back down. And so, yes, you're going to know the sequence number, which will be at the top of the form because it'll come back with a sequence number and select the date MSP received it. So hopefully people are submitting bills every day. Um, you can, if you don't know the date, you could fill it with zero, but it does help for things to happen a lot quicker if you know what date you sent that bill off. Right. So this is why if you printed the full remittance report, you'd have that in front of you and you'd be able to put the debit number here, the sequence number here and the date here quite easily, right? Yes. And then okay. you would hit reprocess and resubmit. So this one, reprocess and, and that and sends resubmit. it back to MSP. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this again, just to review where I found this, I went to the patient's main demographic screen. So you could just patient search, go to their main demographic screen, their master file. So we like to call it. And to the left, you see invoice list. And that's where you'll find the invoice. And 
it would have sequence numbers here, but we don't submit to MSP in this practice version. So we won't have those. If you're going to see it on your remittance statement that you need to make an adjustment, you find the right one by matching your sequence number, hit edit. And then you've got the space to which to change this to 3071, check off amount debited, change the submission code to E for debit request, right? And then reprocess and resubmit. Oh no, then they want the sequence number and the date and then reprocess and resubmit, correct? And this is where you were saying it's Correct. going to show a negative, but then it, it will straighten itself out once MSPs received it. Correct. Okay. Okay. Why else would we change submission codes? I'm noticing it'd just be nice to go over this for people. How, uh, where else would you use this uh, submission code? That one, it would only be uh, specific to debit requests. Duplicate is obviously if you're billing uh, double visits within the same day. So let's say a patient came in in the morning um, with complaints and then went home and then something changed to the day and they had to come back urgently to you um, and you want to attempt to bill both of those visits doesn't always get paid but we can try and so you would use the d for duplicate you'd have to write an electronic note stating the urgency of why the patient needed to be seen um but other than that oh sorry got a question is this the there. spot claim short comment right in here nope so you're going to go to course correspondence code oh, okay up, and it says none right there okay to the left yeah yep yeah. And you're going to write electronic note. Yeah. And you're actually going to put it in the note. Oh, right the short here. claim note is used more for um, driver's medicals. Right. Okay. So we'll put it here. We'll put the note here. And um, we usually put the time, service time, right, for both visits. Um. So I, I think that's more trained, for PCN. Okay, so service time start for both in the same day. And um, it actually can also be paid if it's a completely different reason. So say someone was in for, um, I don't know, a um, scheduled mole removal in the morning or something. Later on, they went home and they fell down the stairs and they have something completely different, sport, sprained ankle, something completely different. If you have the different ICD-9 codes, you are able to bill both in the same day, except you have to follow the same procedure by putting start times, by putting the D for duplicate. And as uh, Jenna can mention, change the to electronic note and put a note here, completely different reasons for visit. Can I add that there yes, is that difference do. between note uh, which is your electronic note and billing notes, which is just an internal messaging center for your office that does not get sent to MSP. It's a very useful area and I'll highlight that in my presentation. Perfect, thank you for sharing that. But that's hugely important because if you don't put it in the right spot, you put electronic note, you won't have anything going if you stick it here. So very important, thanks Dr. Yap. So that would be where the electronic note goes in this area. And maybe before you leave, the other submission yeah. code that I've had to run into uh, more than I'd like is when <laughs> WCB finally rejects your claim after maybe a year, and then yeah. you can rebuild it to MSP, even though it's more than 90 days. So you use the W, claim not accepted by WorkSafe. And yes, even if it's beyond the 90 days, as long as you do the submission code W, you're able to resubmit those bills to MSP. So you would change the insurer to MSP from WorkSafe. Where, where's my insurer? I can't. Uh, nope. So it was WorkSafe, you want to change it to MSP. Oh, it's already billing type MSP, so. Are you able to change the insurer here? Or do you have to you, rebill it completely? You can uh, change the billing type from there. It just doesn't have um, actually all the options it does on the invoice screen. Oh, I see. So it's already MSP. So like you so see, ICBC is not on there? Yeah. 
right? So, so if it was WCB, but WCB would change is. it to MSP. MSP would be there at that point. Okay. The so bill MSP. Okay. And then you would be able to resubmit rejected claims. And like Dr. Yap said, even if it's beyond 90 days, uh, but change the W. Okay. Jennifer? And, yes. Sorry, for ICDC, do you just not leave it on MSP, but change the MBA to yes? Um, I've, n I, I can honestly say I've never had a visit rejected by ICBC, but I normally, when you create the invoice, you're changing the insurer, um, to ICBC at that point. Let's do I, that. There we go. So when you do billing type, yeah. um, you're saying bill ICBC? Bill ICBC. And if you click that, that's where the MVA part co comes up. So I don't know if it's different in some Oscars. In mine, I actually have to acknowledge I'm billing ICBC. And that's where the MVA comes up for me to identify, yes. This is amazing because I've been on Oscar for 13 years and I just noticed this now. So I learned something new. Um, <laughs> maybe that is the trigger for when you're in the billing form to swap to ICBC for that primary billing. The reason we're doing so, I think Herb was probably going to get to this, is if there's an additional service that's MSP related, there's an additional fee you can bill so that you're not providing free services. Uh, you're providing discounted services, but that's another story. <laughs> I can confirm that it also shows, does the same thing when you go into the billing page in OpenOSP in terms of switching to bill ICBC and getting that extra line with the IPCBC claim number and the MBA, yes or no, it also happens in OpenOSP. Yeah, so bill MSP, that's not available to you. So in this version, if you change it to bill ICBC, it'll automatically say yes for you and it'll give you this opportunity. You don't have to have a claim number, but it does need to say yes. Do you have any suggestions on entering the claim number? Do you put the dot or no dot for the, just before the last digit or hyphen? Because I know we used to have problems with it rejected. If, if we put the hyphen, you know, you'd have one, two, three, seven, nine, dash one or dot one. Yeah, so you're not gonna include, I, uh, I wanna say you're gonna do everything with no dashes. So. Um, you know, whatever the claim number is, it's just straight across, don't leave spaces, nothing in between. Um, but also just identifying that it's ICBC, they'll be able to do the math on that too. So as long as you're billing to ICBC, if you have the claim number, that's great. But yes, don't enter spaces, dashes or anything. It's just one solid number in there. Of course, with the um, letters that go before it. Yeah. And I want to also point out, because we're this is our uh, last slide, so one more little tip of the day. When I am training uh, with the RNIPs and with the contract physicians uh, and the NPs, a lot of their work does need to start in the end times. There they are, remembering you put them in here and remembering that they are the 24-hour clock. So a lot of the education pieces for the RNIP require start and end times. And for the contract positions, they need to put a code in with a start time at the first one of their day, first patient of their day, and then the end time at, with a code at the last patient of their day. So And those going are some... to that clock, if you actually click on the clock face itself. Yeah, there you go. You can get that. And if you click on the nine. Yeah. Oh, cool. Isn't that yeah. nice? Look at that. Way to go. Well, and Thank if you. you click on the 34. Yeah. No, no, no. There. Yeah. Wow. There so you, go. you don't even have to type numbers. You just click, click, click. There you go. Nice and quick. Okay. These are your Thank you for that, John. Things. I've never seen that again in 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> there I you use go. that all the time, and it's just so much quicker. Well, I bet with obstetrics, there's a lot of the times used, right? For the deliveries and such. Yeah. They, and they or... still haven't figured out how, how to put a clock inside a uterus. <laughs> okay. So if you're needing to change that submission code that we were looking at when we were editing the billing, here it is when we're actually billing. It's just sitting up here, top right. And um, you can use it here for the debit, the duplicate one and the work safe. There you go. Okay. 
So I think, Jenica, was there anything else, you, tips of the day you wanted to share from the screen? Yeah, okay. I'll just kind of share the resources yeah. that we provided out for uh, any MOAs who'd like some really good cheat sheets. That's I have cool. um, provided Cindy with some of my best cheat sheets. I have hospital billing, which is inclusive of uh, surgical assists, right down to um, uh, delivery and obstetrics. I have included cheat sheets with diagnostic codes for quick reference and I have also included the explanatory codes for rejections so anybody who's looking for a little kind of billing bible I like to call them to just kind of print those off and have them handy uh, I have given my best ones to them to share with you yeah and are you able to see the screen I have for the yes. website for, oh perfect so there you go there's where they all are Cindy so fantastically manage that for us and uh, you're able to find it and there's that infamous YouTube channel that um, Ken was mentioning at the beginning this parts of this video will be put on that YouTube channel you can subscribe to it so that every time new stuff is added you're alerted okay so Oscar VC has got some fabulous YouTubes okay so I think that does it for Jenica and I and um Onwards and upwards, I will stop sharing my screen and Dr. Yap can take over. Great job, Patty and Jenica, mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. All right, just give me a second. I'll just get my screen up and that would be this one. Yes, that was a fantastic presentation. I always uh, am happy when I uh, come away learning some new things and uh, I'm a little embarrassed that I hadn't spotted that after so many years on uh, Oscar. Um, so I wanna thank uh, um, uh, John Robertson, who's gonna help me with this as well. Uh, as mentioned uh, at the beginning, this is a huge area. Um, Oscar is all interlinked and that makes things very complicated and also good if you use it the right way. There are more than 90 slides in this presentation. I am not gonna go over each and every one of them. A lot of the material has been covered. I'd like to give you a high level overview of what can and maybe should be done. And then and, and you'll see that, you know, as good as Oscar is, there are some uh, weaknesses that obviously can and should be addressed. So I hope you can see my screen at this point. Good. All right. So. Uh, just to let you know, I am a family physician. I'm not a programmer, or maybe the right uh, term is developer. I do have an Oscar supported by Well Health, and my uh, group does pay quarterly dues to Oscar BC because we appreciate what they do for us. I have been paid by um, um, practice support program and divisions to support other Oscar users, as well as uh, I work with Oscar BC, but uh, that is uh, voluntary. I am on the executive, as you heard earlier, uh, on Oscar BC, and previous to that, uh, I guess I am still on the Oscar Canada User Society um, board, uh, and I'm currently the um, uh, the president of Oscar BC. Um, I'm a paid member of BC Family Doctors, the formerly Society of General Practice, and I do encourage all family physicians to also support them because there's valuable billing information on um, uh, uh, with your membership. And I will admit that I do enhance my Oscar experience using Grease Monkey scripts. It is an add-on for Firefox. I really can't get through my day without Grease Monkey in the background. And I will highlight where Grease Monkey is being active and where it isn't. So if your Oscar doesn't look like my Oscar, it's likely because of Grease Monkey. Um, so I will try and reduce some of this confusion by staying general and in, in my comments and hopefully they apply to all Oscar-like programs. And for billing related matters, this is not going to help you with billing integrity questions. Please refer to the uh, Doctors BC billing fee guide preamble and such. Um, there are great uh, webinars on billing uh, properly. This is about billing using our program Oscar. Uh, and I said, I will announce when Grease Monkey is in play. And did I mention you should join BC Family Doctors if you're a GP, because you really should. Um, John, do you wanna? Uh... Sure, yeah, so uh, I'm an OBGYN in, uh, in Chilliwack. So run into 
Jenica occasionally as well, um, and used to see Ken on a somewhat regular basis. Um, my computer skills are basically all self-taught, bought some books, did some online teaching, um, and just, yeah, learned as I went along. Uh, I'm using OpenOSP, um, similar to, but not the same as well. Um, and I do also support Oscar BC with quarterly dues. Um, I have been to lots of other doctor's offices throughout uh, Chilliwack and Abbotsford and Langley and over on Vancouver Island and, and help them out. Um, and my work for Oscar BC again is voluntary. Um, and I am on the same boards that uh, John is on. And I would agree with John that I really can't get through my day without Grease Monkey scripts. It's, it's like the morning cup of coffee, I think. Um, but, um, but I do find it quite useful. Um, I, I can turn it all off and show you how it works with all of it, but um, it, it feels like I'm being handcuffed when I, when I do that. Thank you. So um, I think most of our slides are uh, scrubbed clear of any uh, you know, private information. If not, just um, keep in mind um, that uh, <clears throat> you know, this is for learning purposes and we'll keep things in confidence. But I did review all the slides and even the live demo should be um, fairly clean. So uh, in the time remaining, there's uh, too much to cover. And that's why the slides uh, will be released for references. And I said uh, earlier, I hope there's enough information there. If not, um, we should have um, part two of this. So I hope to cover uh, some key areas that were not yet covered by uh, Patty and Jenica. And some of it, I thank them for covering for me because it'll make my job easier. So these are my main goals. Uh, obviously we need to build to get paid and to track our billings and uh, for analysis. Uh, there's internally lots that Oscar will do for you, such as remind you if there's an incentive fee that uh, is owing or available to you. Um, some of you have seen those pop-ups. That data is very valuable for within Oscar and your um, uh, bottom line. Ministry also uses that data. And um, of course, if you're a part of Health Data Coalition, that is also being used there. Uh, how you can bill, obviously, uh, there's different ways. Uh, Patty already showed you that. Um, and just keep in mind that uh, Oscar is indeed an EMR and not an accounting program. It is not the best billing program. It is not the worst billing program. It is what it is and obviously can be improved. Some of you may use third-party uh, uh, billing software that is enhanced like ClinicAid or even standalone ones. Obviously, there's additional fees and additional hassles. It's your choice. Uh, I've even heard people using paper billing and couldn't quite understand yes. why uh, somebody is not muted and talking in the background. Um, but hey, old habits die hard. If it works for you, who, what am I, who am I to say? So here's a quick summary. Bill from the chart, bill from the schedule, bill from the invoice, uh, sorry, master demographics. I'm going to cover three main areas, MSP billings, private billings, and the bane of my existence, WCB billings, uh, also known as 10% of my revenues and 90% of my billing headaches. That alone may require a separate webinar. Having said that, I think I'm going to contradict myself and jump into that uh, eventually. General principles are um, you need right demographic information to be successful in billing. So date of birth and PHN. Um, there is a function in master demographics called check eligibility. Please try that out. It is extremely powerful. Um, and WCB wants even more information. Most of that form has to have some kind of data input, uh, employer information, date of injury, past medical history and such. If you don't have that, not only will you not be able to make the claim, Oscar won't even save that claim. So it will tell you that things are missing. Please correct. And as a hint, if you don't know a phone number, for example, just put in an X. At least that way it will get saved and you can still send it. Choose the correct billing type. It's been said over and over and complete the billings as soon as you can, maybe after you finish saving a note or after you finish calling the patient or completing that private insurance form. So I hope you can see this. At the top left margin are the billing uh, items, billing invoice list, check eligibility and create invoice. If you have not 
clicked on check eligibility, try it out. This is a separate database. It's linked to your Teleplan password. So if you don't get a, a, a report, it may be because your password has expired, but it will tell you if that patient has um, uh, a, a paid up uh, um, uh, MSP account. Um, and if it doesn't match, it may be a name issue or a birthday issue. Um, and of course, make sure the birth date is correct and the um, PHN is correct. And that uh, check eligibility will help you do that. Um, there it is, uh, highlighted. Uh, this is a pretend patient, obviously, and there's no PHN. Now, in my well version of uh, Oscar, in the schedule, there's a little icon that pops up next to the status symbol. Uh, you can see I've put an arrow to the plus sign. That actually is a link to when the last time one had checked the eligibility. And it kind of looks like this. Um, so the hashtag says um, eligible, which has a typo, previously before appointment calendar month. Um, I'm sure that means something. Um, as soon as I figure it out. <laughs> but this is a quick way of looking at your schedule to see who may or may not have MSP and um, if they've been checked recently. Uh, might be good for those clinics that have a lot of um, you know, uh, transient patients. In my version of OSCAR, there is a way of displaying that and it's under schedule management in admin. If you don't have that, it may be because you have not been updated. Uh, it's something to ask your uh, OSP or vendor to. Uh, to look into. So where that is, is under the second to last line here, display teleplan eligibility next to each appointment. And I just checked yes. Um, jumping back to the um, e-chart, um, timing is everything. And that little stopwatch can be very valuable. If you click on it, it indicates when you entered the chart, that's your start time and the time you click, which is your end time. Um, very useful for uh, time sensitive billings and uh, clinical notes. What I do with that is I copy that and I place that into um, the billing. Um, I'll just show you. Uh, actually, before I do that, uh, here's my billing sheet, sort of the uh, GP uh, billing form. Uh, it has some enhancements up at the top. There's a little yellow icon I've highlighted. That's a grease monkey enhancement. And down at the bottom, there's these um, blue quick pick. So all these, um, uh, there's my mouse, all these uh, fee codes that are um, embedded in here through your form customization um, give you enhancements such as the associations. But um, Grease Monkeys also put some down here for direct uh, uh, access. Uh, without that uh, Grease Monkey running, it looks kind of like your conventional one. So it's still there. Um, you can see my service codes are here, my diagnostic codes are here, and these diagnostic codes are ones that have been previously used. So if you can't remember what the code should be, you might find it here. And although uh, it doesn't say what it is, if you hover over it, you'll see later, it will actually uh, pop up the uh, title of that code. So you've heard it before, make sure you've selected your provider. Um, that can be preset. Uh, under billing preferences if you have that feature, which is here, edit billing preferences. And just uh, keep in mind, this may be available to well only. If it's not, hopefully uh, you can set this. So I've set my default billing form to general practice. If you have a nurse in practice, she would very much welcome having it set to her nurse form so that she doesn't always have to switch. Um, I thought that I could adjust this, which is what goes into your private billing um, at, at this level, but unfortunately it's ghosted out and I just learned last night that no, I can't adjust it. It may be something I have to ask my OSP for. I, I believe actually you adjust that in a different location. You adjust that with your clinic settings. Ah, very good. Um, but I don't want to adjust it for the whole clinic. I just want to adjust it for me. Anyways, to be determined. Um, you can bill from the um, uh, schedule, obviously, that's the B. And if you do so, once it's billed, you get this wonderful, satisfying blue that says it was billed. And, and now you see a minus sign. The minus sign means you can take away that billing if you made an oops. Uh, if you do that, you'll get this little warning. 
you are about to delete, you say okay, and it's done. And then you may get something that looks like this. If you've um, undone the billing, the minus sign is gone. Uh, previously, my whole line here would go blank and I couldn't even see what was in there. And that's because it changed the status to something that I didn't have control over. Right now it changes the status too. Uh, so if that happens to you, you can't see the name, which you're gonna need uh, to finish what you're doing, you just change the status. So this isn't part of billing, this is part of your scheduling, but this is the status area. So you kind of have to uh, search over to where you think the name would be if it's totally blank, click on that, and then you'll get this screen and just change it to something else that you're more comfortable with, all right. Now, if you're not in the schedule and you still want to undo a billing, and this is different from what Jenica and Patty had demonstrated, this is before you send it, before Telephone gets a, a hold of it, you can do it easily. The key thing is don't settle the billing because that freezes the claim and then it's hard, not impossible, just hard to get access to it again. And the reason you wanna do this is you can still show uh, or keep the audit trail is what happened. Um, so the key thing is in the third line, set to do not bill, bill with zero units, and I will actually demonstrate that. So here it is. This is a billing that should not go through. Uh, number one, at the top, select do not bill. Number two, it usually has a preset unit of one. You, you bill it one time. Uh, change that to zero and then click on recalculate and now the fee item is zero and that'll be good for your accounts receivable because it won't show that the amount is always owing. Um, and then towards the um, bottom, you can click uh, reprocess bill. And if you want to make a note in billing notes, you can just say that, you know, incorrectly billed or whatever you wish. You don't have to resubmit it because it's not going to be set. Once you set reprocess, then the billing goes to do not bill and then it's settled and your accounts receivable clerk would be so much happier that they won't have to chase this one. Um, another area that you need to pay attention to is indeed your service and diagnostic code area. And uh, next door to that are the existing previously used diagnostic codes. You can see I've hovered over 847 and that refers to springs and strings of the other and I can't read the rest, but you can jiggle your mouse around and probably display the entire title. Um, not all titles are intuitive. Uh, some are just downright misleading and frustrating, um, but you can fix that. You can fix that by um, searching for a, uh, in this case, it's a fee item. And I think I searched for NP and all the things that have NP in it show up. You can add whatever text you want. You can edit this. Once you add whatever you want, you can update it. And now if you wanna search for a fee code that says, hey, I can edit this, it'll come to this one. You can do the same thing for diagnostic codes. So if you wanna change all your open wounds to lacerations, go at it. Um, but you know, there's just some, uh, for example, if you're looking for Crohn's disease, it'll probably be under regional art enteritis. Change it to Crohn's if you wish. And uh, you have so much space to do it and just make sure you update it. Uh, very powerful. This is what I was referring to about using the billing notes and using your time sensitive um, uh, uh, billing items. Uh, click on the stopwatch and highlight the start and end time. Paste it in the billing notes because I have the short term memory of a goldfish. I would take this time here 315 and the end time 323. I can still see it, it's all on the same page. And then I would add it there. And then you're good to go. So use the scratch pad. Uh, or the billing notes, not the notes. So <clears throat> I'm switching over to private billings. This is my version of a private billing form. And I did try and organize things, BCMA stuff here, um, RCFP. Oh boy, I need to change the title. That's the name of my old clinic and various others. Um, these quick pick items, uh, you have a limit of 20, which is probably not enough. Um, but it is what it is. Um, you can change this form by just clicking billing type and switching to private. When this uh, is chosen, uh, billing form automatically changes to private as well. Just know that uh, when you change from private back to MSP, this will not necessarily change. So it's a bit of a one-way street, but that's how you would change it. 
Um, there you go. I changed it back to MSP, but it's still a private billing form and all the private stuff. You actually have to change it from here as well. So maybe an enhancement that can be uh, uh, improved later. So here is a private fee, an example of something that I build that is an A0040. Now that doesn't exist in the um, private billing form. I made that up, it's a four digit code. Most um, doctors of BC uh, private fee codes are five digit codes. Uh, and I did that to distinguish my codes from you know, the official um, uh, SGD codes. Oops, back one, sorry. Um, so these are the official ones, Doctors of BC rates, and uh, I did change the title to Nuance Family Practice. Uh, why do I have four digit codes? Because sometimes I only want to charge 20 bucks or 25 bucks. So you can make any denomination you want and just keep it at a four digit code. And the legal ICBC stuff here uh, and so on. Um, so yeah, you can do that. And I have some slides showing you how. I won't go through all the gory details because that's something you'll have to discover on your own. and it's. Um, we're, we're kind of strapped for time. But here's an example of that fee. Um, use this page to confirm that everything is right. The fee amount, who's getting paid, um, the date and all, all the rest. You save and print the receipt so you can see a preview of the receipt. So here we go. This one has a single item in this um, 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 invoice. And you can add billing notes uh, to it. That can be an internal. Uh, in my version of Oscar, I can print the notes, which is something I always had wanted. You might want to reference a policy number, a uh, reference number, attention to whoever the adjuster is. And previously, you couldn't do that um, without just, you know, making an annotation on the PDF. Now you can, or you can just keep it private. Okay. Um, so if you don't have print with notes, it may be a feature that you can ask for. So here, internal notes, print with notes if you want to send that. These fields can be adjusted. So the default being your patient uh, might be changed. And mostly, most of the time it is changed to the lawyer, ICBC, and so on. Um, and then you, when you get paid, hopefully, uh, you can reconcile uh, the accounts with receive payment and make note of um, you know, the amount paid, uh, the format, check, visa, um, direct deposit or whatever. I also like to add the in the notes when it was paid and a, the check number received in case you ever have to search for uh, anything as a reference. That's very powerful. So uh, jumping to uh, the bane of my existence, WCB billings, um, you know, in a word it's awkward. It's not a soap note, it's an ass backwards, a soft note and everybody will who, who does this will know what I mean. Um, just keep in mind when you change it to WCB billing, if you provide an MSP service, you can still bill that, albeit at a discounted rate. That's the 13070 fee. Um, and um, in the billing, in the schedule page, the um, satisfying blue color will not appear. You have to change that annually. Um, I initially didn't think I would want to dive into WCB billing, but it turns out that uh, I made slides directly uh, uh, directed to that. But I will cover these other things. And I apologize that this may seem rushed, but it's all here for future reference. WC billing, you can access the actual billing form and the clinical notes from here. It is indeed a form, not an e-form, a form. You can write your notes here in the traditional e-chart area. I actually don't, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, when you click that, it opens this. And for those who've been around a while, you'll recognize this is the paper, uh, the digital version of what the paper form used to be. As I mentioned previously, almost every field here has to be filled, including the WCB claim number eventually. Honestly, I haven't actually been updating that. But recently I was told to do so because a uh, patient had actually two injuries on the same day. How lucky. Um, they want to distinguish one from the other. Um, so fill all of this in, add your diagnosis, make sure the date of service is correct, and make sure the date of injury is correct. And this is where you put your SOAP note um, and uh, so on. Um, so, sorry, go back. When you fill in the codes here, um, the 
Oscar knows how to transfer it back to the uh, next page. Uh, if you don't know what the codes are, just click on anything that's blue and it will search or display um, uh, the available choices to you. Uh, search is limited. So if you don't know what the service code is, that's the office visit, um, you know, search for office visit, uh, uh, office. Um, but that's usually your, you know, 0100 series, your ICD-9 codes, hopefully you know that. If you don't, put in sp um, sprain and search for it. Body part, I always search for. I don't know what WCB code for elbow is. So I'll put in elbow and search for it. And the nature of injury, similarly, you know, strain, sprain, that sort of thing. All right. Um, and then fill in the rest. So here I filled in the codes after searching for them. And when I hit save and bill at the bottom, you'll recognize this as the general practice code, but you'll notice that it already changed to billing type as WCB. And there it is, the codes, including diagnostic codes, automatically placed for you. Um, and that's great, but do pay attention because lower down in the bottom left corner of that is your form. And it will tell you if you have any errors or deficiencies. In this case, this is a pretend patient with no PHN. So there's one error under the verify form not needed area. Uh, and it says, uh, just fill in the PHN. So you would click on the form, go back to it, add the PHN, save and bill and come back and hopefully you'll get two zeros and you're good to go. Yeah, uh, I didn't know what F and N meant, so I hovered over it and it actually tells you. Wow, um, but this takes time and practice to do, and I didn't even mention why I write my notes in the actual form itself. It's because there are character limits of about 800 characters. So I use abbreviations extensively. I, um, I, I trim down any prescription notes, uh, to just name the drug, etc. Um, I don't use any uh, line spaces or paragraphing because you're limited to 800 characters. If you add any more, you won't, it won't be accepted. So if you went the other way and wrote a, a, a novel, you can paste it into the um, form, um, but it'll truncate at 800 characters and the folks at WCB won't be able to appreciate your, um, your uh, extensive story. Um, customization has, addressed, has been addressed to some degree. Um, this is the default form. Um, this column cannot be changed, probably should not be changed because they're age specific fee codes. So this person is 50. So all the 15, uh, um, 000, 000 series show up, but this can be changed. The titles, complex fees and other, uh, the order that they show can be changed. And I'll show you uh, that in a second. So, um, this is my private billing form. Um, here we have a contract GP form. So codes are different. All the dollar values are zero. Um, turns out if they do WCB stuff, they can bill for that. Um, but this is all kind of foreign to me because I'm not a contract doctor. The RNIP fees are here. Uh, you have to create this. And I think um, uh, Jenica and Patty probably gave you cheat sheets on what are the codes to use. And I even created for myself a long-term care form because I do residential care. All right, and that again is here under billing preferences and you've seen this earlier. And I hope that all of you have access to this, whether you're a Juno user or an OpenOSP user, it is very powerful. It allows you to save many a click. Uh, you've seen this earlier, how to create uh, uh, or edit a billing form. Uh, the steps are here. And here are the uh, quick pick items, uh, office visit, don't touch, complex care or other, you can rename them. This, this number in the right column tells Oscar at uh, the order you wish to display. So you don't have to move these numbers to the top. All you have to do is make this number lower, okay? And that basically sets the order. So it's kind of nice. Here is a new billing form uh, page. Um, indeed, add an ID number. If you don't have an ID number, it'll be hard to um, fix any errors because I found I had to get um, the OSP to extricate uh, my mistake and I had to start all over again. But indeed, give them proper names, give it a title that you recognize and off you go. 
The managed teleplan area is important where you can get new billing codes, explanatory codes, and ICD-9 codes. This maintenance item um, that someone can attend to, it's fairly easy to do, it's all done behind the scenes. The change teleplan code is something we all have to get at, uh, at least on a monthly basis, because we'll lose access otherwise, and I'll address that. Set teleplan password is something you do when you just start up. Um, generally, you don't go back to it. And of course, we all want to get paid, so uh, hit the get remittance once in a while. If I update my billing codes, if you update your billing codes, you're going to get this huge list. Green, I think, means it's new, or the amount went up. Hooray. Um, but you want to let this load. And if there's a lot, it could take a few minutes. Do not leave this page. Do not do anything else. Just let it finish. Scroll down to the bottom to see that it is done uploading. Otherwise, it may be incomplete. This is what it may look like for error codes. Again, give it time. And if it's updated, this is what you'll get. There's nothing to display, so you're good. And you do need to change your password. I believe it's every four weeks, six weeks, sorry, maybe. Um, eventually, it'll not allow you to send a billing, and this is where you do it. You have to know your current password, and you have to create a new password and confirm that. Uh, I keep track by sending myself a message, and I give the subject teleplan password change. I actually send it to my partners in case they're the ones who have to make the change. So um, put in the new password, all right? You can be creative or not. Just keep a record of it. And then later on, when you want to look for that old password, you can search. This is a really powerful part of messages. Just type in that, that keyword tag, telephone password, search for it, and there they are. Um, just make sure you, oh, whoever does the task of sending a new password has to send the message. Uh, uh, and finally, um, I, uh, I do use it. I do save it slightly differently. Um, it depends on your office, but... There is a scratch pad um, right when you go into the um, into the appointment page. Um, uh -huh. It's sort of on the right hand side, most of the way up, and you can right just here. click on right there. Yeah, and you can click on the scratch pad. Now the scratch pad is unique to each person that logs in. So your scratch pad is you, and if somebody else logs in, they will not see the, your scratch pad. They'll see their own. But if you have one billing person that does all of that billing stuff, they can open up their scratch pad and they can put the new password in um, and keep it there for themselves. Yeah, so if you wanna keep it completely private, that's where you should put that information. Excellent. Um, Patty uh, um, actually addressed this earlier. When you get your remittance, um, you have all this stuff. I mean, I've obviously uh, kind of, um, hidden all the amounts, but I generally have never gone to this. And I do find that the summary is very powerful information. Uh, I hadn't looked at it until like earlier this year. You'll get stuff like this. Um, and you have lots of time you can read up to it. They're redefining our um, billing payee numbers now. Um, that's for uh, the actual programmers to fix because um, payee numbers are only numeric at the present time. But there's Useful information there, so pay attention to that. Uh, this is addressed uh, to make billing more efficient. Um, match your um, service codes with diagnostic codes. Uh, there are obvious ones, the incentive billing ones. This is for diabetes, so make sure you bill for diabetes. You bill for anything else, it'll get rejected. Similarly, um, you can uh, match uh, procedure fees to um, 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 tray fees, so the obvious ones are here. And if you didn't need it, of course, you can always take it out. Um, next down the list is manage referral doctors for those making referrals. Um, this is a bit of a nightmare because there are 16,000 names in my list. Um, it's not the easiest thing to manipulate, but you'll know that if a new doctor comes on board, um, you have to add it. Uh, no one else is gonna do it for you. It's not a you know update with one click uh, sort of thing. Uh, so I search for my name and these are all the last names that have the text string YAP in it. Um, the key thing here is the unique ID code is your billing number. Um, so this number here, you cannot create two entries with the same billing number. 
Similarly, if you put in a billing number that's erroneous, um, it will accept it. Um, and then you can never delete it. Well, you can't, but your OSB can. So, so pay attention to those details. Um, and of course, when you've done your day's billing, uh, you create a simulate submission file to preview, uh, preview that. I uh, do it for my own claims. Watch the time here. Um, so uh, I, I don't like it when all providers are chosen because I don't see you know what I've done as readily. Um, quick pick, uh, if you want to choose your name and your name is at the bottom of the alphabet, like mine is, instead of scrolling down, I type in Y, the first letter of your last name, it'll jump to that area. And then generate teleplan. So uh, this is where you send. Uh, this one's already been sent. I do one provider at a time. This one is queued up to send. When you click it, you have to wait. It takes maybe a minute, but once it's gone, you'll see the send. If that doesn't go through, it likely is Teleplan is taking a rest, so try again later, or your password is expired. I'm gonna jump ahead to private billing. This is where you create your codes. Um, and this may look different from Juno and OpenOSP. I hope they get to here uh, at some point because this is a huge enhancement because you can edit those codes. Previously, you can create one, but you cannot delete one. And now you can. Uh, I won't go into this too much, play with it a bit, um, and you'll see. Uh, the instructions are here. Um, you can name them appropriately. You can emulate the uh, uh, titles in um, the Doctors of BC fee guide, and that makes sense. Every April 1st, we get a pay raise for these fee codes, so update it and set the date when you updated it. And here's my note about doing some um, unique billing uh, codes just for your office. Right, jumped ahead too far. Um, indeed, uh, if you search for a code that already exists, you can't build two with the same name or unique title. Here is an invoice with two fee items. And uh, it's great when you do that the first time because it's all on one page, but you know, if you try to do it again uh, later, it will split the uh, fee items into separate pages, which is a real nuisance. And this is where Grease Monkey comes into play. Uh, pay attention to this invoice number, it ends in 327. In this patient's chart, uh, when you go to invoice list, here's 327, that's the A0040 code. The second one is this one, which is attached to it. And I want to recreate this um, invoice with both of them on the same page, and there's where Grease Monkey comes in. There is a create statement, or recreate statement more accurately. I punch in the... Uh, lines, the invoice lines, separated by commas, and I hit OK, and you will indeed get that back again, uh, and it will recreate it with today's date. The uh, Grease Monkey script, and that's for another webinar, um, is available here. If you already have Grease Monkey, go to the site, and it will um, uh, give you the uh, script for that. I'm over time already, um, and I apologize, but if you want to maximize your billings, please make use of dashboard, okay? Especially the billing area where it tells you, you know, how many diabetes um, um, uh, patients are eligible for the billing, heart failure patients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, take advantage, that's another webinar. Or you can use a report by template to do the same thing. Um, this captures for the GPs out there, all the 1405 series. Um, and it's available here for you. Uh, again, report by templates is another webinar. I've uh, probably used more time than I had, but John, do you have anything uh, you want to add? Sorry, Cindy sent me a bunch of questions that I'm answering uh, at the moment. But um, no, most of that is um, most of that is exactly as John says. There are. Just a couple of, uh, we were talking about searching for things and there is a, um, there is a wildcard character, the percent. And so when you're searching for um, billing codes and when you're searching for diagnostic codes, you can put a percent sign in as a wildcard to help you to search for things. So um, I'm searching for a service code here. Uh, give me an example of what I would want to search for. Well, okay. So, um, 
uh, consult for an OBGYN is an 04010. Um, but if you put 04% 10, and then search that. I can type 04% and hit. And, and search that. Yeah. Ah. Then what you get is an 04010, but also an, all the other numbers between one and nine in that spot. So you choose the code you wish, hit confirm, yeah. and then it transfers there. Yeah. Excellent. The unit code is usually blank, but the default when you send it is going to be one. Yeah. Here's your diagnostic code. And if you wanted to search for a sprain, you'll get all of this. And you can update by changing it here and click update. Um, yeah. you and may... that's really useful. Um, if you spent half an hour trying to find a code and you finally found it. Once you get to that spot, before you do your billing, make it easier for yourself the next time around. Go to that line and put stuff in it that makes sense to you as opposed to the person who put it in there. And next time when you go to search for it, it'll take you 20 seconds instead of 20 minutes. Yeah, um, let's see. It won't allow me to search 555. Oh, it will. So the uh, original title for uh, Crohn's disease is regional enteritis. I added the Crohn's disease. I could and have just added Crohn's. You can do multiple things. You can do Crohn's disease. You can just go Crohn's. You can, um, you can um, put, um, so you can put multiple things in that line. And if you think that you might... You might search it several different ways. There's, you can put as much information in there as you want so that you're more likely to find it the next time you go looking for it. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you can only do one at a time. So if I did this, it'd probably kick me out. Yeah, there yeah. we go. And then click the back arrow. Oh, darn it, um, back arrow. Hey, that makes it a lot faster. Thank you, John. There's yeah. another thing today. So um, you, you're gonna have fun doing this. It's gonna make life easier. And I agree, if it takes you you know, 20 minutes to find that code, um, put it in there so it only takes you two seconds next time. Any other questions? I'm sure there are lots. Cindy has quite a few questions, I think lined up from the chat. John. Yeah, working on it, working on it. <laughs> okay. I'm yeah, I have myself. sent I have sent the questions to the webinar leads, except for you, Don, because I know you were focusing on uh, presenting that section there. But I will send them to you now. Um, it, we it may be the case like there are so many great questions that perhaps the webinar leads could possibly um, answer them on a video that we can upload to the YouTube channel. Um, the billings playlist. But I mean, see, you know, Patty or Jenica, were there any of the questions I sent you that you could start answering? Uh, there's, there is a question, what, what are Grease Monkey scripts? Well, um, okay, short answer. Um, it is a, it's a workaround that, um, that runs inside the particular laptop or desktop that you're using. It is an add-on to uh, the Firefox browser. Um, the, there is a, um, there's a repository of um, Grease Monkey scripts that uh, have been put together by, sorry, blanking on name. Um, John, help me here. Um, anyways, um, Stan Hurwitz, right? Stan. Yeah. So Stan has a, his own uh, web page on BitHub and he's got a gazillion Grease Monkey scripts to make your life easier. Um, and he is on the discussion groups so you can get on the discussion groups and just ask him to point you to that. Um, you do install Grease Monkey on Firefox and once Grease Monkey is installed on Firefox, then you can add scripts in and as John has shown you, you can make your life a lot easier. Yeah, um, that one link I sent uh, for the um, create statement Grease Monkey script, 
um, on OCUS, which is where it's um, hosted, um, you'll see Stan's other work. Um, it's extremely powerful stuff. Um, I might tease you with a uh, uh, display of my e-chart to show you uh, that in a second. Can we maybe address, uh, that, that'll be our cliffhanger for this webinar. Um, can we address the other questions? Uh, and Cindy, you wanna direct our attention to what you might feel needs attention now? There's a few that I could probably uh get to off yeah. the top. So the new COVID vaccine advice, the 10045, it's been, an the feedback is nobody's getting paid for it at this point. Um, anyone who's billed it, it's the rejection is coming back no matter what. Um, so I think this is something that needs to be reported to MSP because the feedback that I get from a number of offices is this code is not working. Um, so I think we just need to find out what they're actually looking for. Do they want to start an end time of the visit? Yes. Then plus 10 minutes. Um, what are they considering is the first half of the visit? How long do they consider that before the 10 minutes is added? Um, so that one's been a little bit of a tricky one. Um, when it comes you have to, to Jenica, you have yeah. to bill uh, something that is not COVID related as yes. your visit fee. You need to start an end time and bill the second. Yeah, and that's what we've been doing. Unfortunately, MSP has been rejecting the one zero zero four five regardless. Okay, so it's inside uh, information here. Teleplan is based on uh, a, a programming code uh, known as COBOL. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay, so John knows because he's <laughs> old enough to know. Um, that pretty much explains it all. That Look became it extinct before the dinosaurs. <laughs> That's what yeah. they use. It is what it is. All right, well, we'll go on. Uh, let me just see here. Um, some rejection codes, time service was rendered or missing or invalid. I'd look at the code you're trying to bill. Some of them have time specific. So if you're doing a mental health planning fee, it's a minimum 30 minutes, 27 minutes is not 30. So always look at what you're trying to bill. It may just be you haven't actually completed the minimum time. Um, what else do we have here? I'm not too uh, keen on the delivery for when it starts on one day and ends on another. John, do you know? Yeah, I, I put something in there. Okay. Uh, what often happens for people is they don't change the day. Yeah. So you've put a billing in for um, either you're, you're on the next day already and you've put both, both numbers on, say, the 15th when you started on the 14th or you put both numbers on the 14th when you stretched over to the 15th. And you have to make sure that the, you started on the 14th and your time and day was on the 14th, and then you finished on the 15th with your time and day on the 15th. Perfect. Uh, I have another question here about adding in babies. Uh, last name, obviously go under mom. Now with Oscar, um, they use a special abbreviation for newborns, which is newborn female, newborn male. So it's M N B M or N B F. And then what I do is I put the chosen, like the child's name in brackets until the care card is, is updated. And then you can update the chart at that time. I'm not sure if that you helps. You can also put the mom's name in brackets as well. So you can put the child's name and the mom's name both in brackets. And that will help you find the mom if you've got a lot of Mrs. Smith's that had deliveries in the last month. I take it to one other level, and that is in the demographics, you can link that patient with their relatives. Mm -hmm. So add the mother's name and the, you know, the link is right there, one click away. So where is it here if I'm showing you the screen? Can you see it? So um, where's the relative? You have to click uh, edit mode. I don't see edit mode for well, this some is reason. adding. This is a create demographic. Yeah, you have to go to Mickey Mouse or whoever you have that Oh, exists. I see. Okay, yeah. okay, good. We'll do that. We'll do mouse. Okay. And then edit. Okay. And um, where is it? Good question. Can I pipe up for a second? Can you yeah, guys hear me? Um, yeah. It's not on the edit screen. If you close the edit screen and right yeah. where it says add relation, there's an underlined blue. Oh, you're right. You close this. One screen before. Close that. Yeah. Okay. Update that. 
And you see where, where it says add relation? Click the blue underlined add relation. Other it's right underneath the name. Relation. Oh, I see. Right. So click on that. Okay. From here? Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. Right, right from that screen. First date. Okay. Okay. Under demographic, under it says the language. Name, first name, you're on the left hand side, Patty. Story. Okay, here yeah. we go. And then it says okay. add relation up, up, up. Yeah. Other contacts, add relation is blue underlined. Of course, there. because it's blue. Yes. There add you go. Thank you. Minnie, yeah. and Minnie will be the wife. Yeah. Actually, oh, no, you have spelled. to it's under mouse. <laughs> it's Minnie Mouse. Yeah. It's, you have to also type right. There you go. And you click her demographic. You click her, and then you pick what kind of a uh, relationship she is. So emergency yeah. contact, or so you mother, see to the left daughter, it says mother wife. is default, but if you uh, hit that drop down, it'll go down to the others. Wow. Yeah, I don't know why that mother is, is a so... default, but it is. I think because initially it was mostly mums and babies. Yeah, because probably, you didn't yeah. have the demo link as well, so a lot of people didn't bother putting this information in. Type W, wow. and hopefully, it'll go to wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's spouse or spouse. No, there okay. is wife. Oh, there is wife. Yeah, keep going up, keep going up, 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 up. So, oh, yeah, there it is up at the top. Oh, you know how it sorts? It sorts by the order of this list. Okay, there the you top. go. So it's not in alphabetical, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, and then add relationship, and then yeah, yeah, and then and you, you can, can add just comments go back. like ex-wife nope. or yeah, and, and then, then just, just do F five a refresh. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And then you yeah. also have a demo link right into their either main demo or their e chart, which is also really handy. Wow, you, I didn't ever see that before, Valerie. Thank you. That's so cool. <laughs> Years well, of doing really demographics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so, so wonderful. And, and a, fair, a fair chunk of OCD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. That's so cool. Um, I, I think anybody who uses Oscar knows that the work is front end loaded. A little bit of effort, or maybe a lot of effort at the beginning, pays off at the end. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a mounting number of questions on the side here, and we should try to yeah. get through them. But we also have to respect that it's ten twenty eight, and we said we were running to ten thirty. So yeah, it may be helpful to add to anybody who is you know getting a lot of rejections, and you're just not sure what's happening with them. Teleplan is if you phone and speak with the rejections line, people will walk you through what's wrong with the claim. You're gonna need your data center number, you're gonna need the sequence number and the rejection code that you're getting. I recommend having the bill in front of you. They do limit three questions per call. You go back into queue if you have more, um, but they will walk you through exactly what's wrong with your bills. So if you have a lot of rejection questions, I recommend contacting Teleplan. They're really helpful and they're, they're great at really educating me even when I have my own issues. Um, Absolutely. And practitioner services is uh, very quick to pick up. It's not a long wait. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. Um, Grease Monkey on Google Chrome. Um, um, as an aside, Oscar is originally designed to run best on Firefox. So I will, in, uh, I will say that I would first advocate using Firefox. But for those that are using Chrome, um, there is something called Tamper Monkey, which is similar. The code is not exactly the same, and there is a bit of translation that has to occur. Um, so you may need some help in that, but you may be able to transfer some of these over from uh, Firefox to Google Chrome. I would also say that there has been a lot of interesting stuff in the news lately about the amount of information that is being gathered by Google using uh, their various apps, including Chrome. And you may want to be just a bit cautious about using a browser that is harvesting vast amounts of information. I will point out there was one comment around the debit request. Yes, I'm sorry, I skipped that point before. Adding in an electronic note explaining why you're asking for your bill to be debited is needed. So my apologies for skipping that step. Okay, Ken, do you want to wrap up? 
Yes, thanks, uh, John and and John and Jenica and and Patty. Uh, great job. Uh, covered a lot of ground here for for those of you I'm sure that are uh, more experienced at Oscar. I, I am not zero experience, so I I really am impressed with uh, the amount of knowledge that goes on to this. But uh, Oscar BC and and our panelists are certainly uh, available if you have some more specific questions. And uh, I know, as was mentioned earlier, the, uh, the list server, the mail list uh, that Oscar has can be quite valuable. Both uh, there's a BC user list, there's a advanced user list, there's a developer list, there's an MOA list, uh, several of them. So uh, check, check that out. We can, uh, we can certainly give you the links to those if you, if you wish. They're on SourceForge, I believe, website. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. One recommendation, do, do not buy chocolate bars in this weather. <laughs> very, don't put them in your pocket, Ken. No, very messy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Enjoy um, the sun and stay cool. Yeah. Stay hydrated. Thank, thank you, everybody. <laughs>